I'm going to be talking tonight uh, about a really revolutionary way of looking at healing uh, that you probably never thought much about, uh, but it's really the future of uh, modern medicine, the future of uh, holistic medicine, it's the future of preventative medicine. Uh, and it has to do uh, with harmony uh, that starts at the most fundamental part of life, uh, which is our DNA. Everybody should be able to live well into their 80s and 90s or beyond, but not just live that long, but be healthy and vibrant. I mean, who wants to live to that age if uh, your joints have all uh, eroded, you can't walk or you can't hear, uh, you can't see, you can't remember uh, the people in your life? I mean, what's the point? And it's possible to be healthy and vibrant well into that age. You can grow new brain cells well into your 90s with the right nutrition. It used to be thought you could only do it till you're about 15 years old. Every culture except ours uh, right now has used sound and music as part of their healing practices. And we've sort of gotten away uh, from the power of sound and music. So, you know, it's like trying uh, to describe uh, certain things, like trying to describe sweet, you know, to somebody who can't taste. It's not possible. Uh, but when you do meditations like we just did, you know, you feel it. And there are a number of ways of measuring it now that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, but you can literally measure it down to a gene expression level. Uh, there are uh, tests called heat maps that you can do to show just during meditation, just during sound healing, just during pranayama, you can activate hundreds and hundreds of genes that will decrease inflammation, turn on tumor suppressor genes, uh, things like that. But tone uh, is sensed by the ears. You hear tone, you hear music with your ears, but your body is 75% water. It's an excellent conductive medium for sound and vibration. So you're hearing literally with every cell in your entire body. Also, if you look at the way DNA is formed, it will have parent strands that will unwind, and then a new strand will form, and you'll get new DNA. Uh, so, you know, that's very similar to the sound that underlies the entire universe, which is OM. Uh, a lot of people think it's OM, it's more AUM. So the A is creation, which is here. Sustaining is you. And then the M is uh, the destruction, the unwinding. And so it's all the spiral energy. This is what's happening in you constantly. That's why, you know, there's no such thing really as silence. You could uh, go in a completely soundproof room and meditate. You'll hear. And what you'll hear is ohm. But there's really no such thing as the absence of sound. What silence really is is a space uh, that you create within your heart to where you can just feel uh, divine. That's what silence. So the whole purpose of sound is to create silence, is to create space. So the right use of sound is to create silence. But silence isn't the absence of sound. Uh, there's no such thing as that. Just the sound ohm, it's creating itself everywhere in the universe. There's nowhere that that sound doesn't exist. So this is uh, an interesting slide. I'm not going to go too much into this, but it shows epigenetics. This is a mouse called the agouti mouse. And that mouse has a very uh, pale yellowish coat, uh, becomes obese early in life, becomes diabetic early in life, 
and develops cancer a bit later. Uh, so there was a scientist at Duke named Randy Jertle uh, who had the idea about epigenetics and fed this mouse while she was pregnant. Um, things like betaine, which comes from sugar beets, uh, folic acid, B12, uh, things that have to do with epigenetics or gene expression. It doesn't change the genes, just changes the expression. So she gave birth to mice that look like this. A normal dark coat, did not become obese, did not become diabetic, did not uh, develop cancer. And this was heritable. In other words, it was carried across generations just from what that mother ate while she was pregnant. But there's a dark side uh, to this also because the, a lot of the toxins in our environment, they can uh, affect your DNA and be passed on from generation to generation. And as I'll talk about in a minute, stress in your life can be passed on from generation to generation. So there's a new field called behavioral epigenetics. And so we know diet and chemicals can cause epigenetic changes. And so the question was raised, could uh, things like child abuse, child neglect, uh, severe stress set off epigenetic changes, changes in gene expressions uh, inside the neurons of a person's brain. And could that be passed on from generation to generation? And uh, dozens of studies uh, suggest that this is the case, uh, and it'll probably result in a lot of new treatments uh, for this. So uh, traumatic experiences uh, we know that epigenetic scars adhere to our DNA. Uh, and so, you know, Jews whose great-grandparents were in concentration camps, they carried these epigenetic changes. Uh, Chinese whose grandparents lived through the Cultural Revolution, immigrants from Africa whose parents survived massacres, uh, adults who grew up with an alcoholic or abusive parent creates number of epigenetic changes that can lead to everything from depression, uh, to cancer, uh, to Crohn's disease, uh, to uh, dementia. Uh, it affects so many areas, and um, this is something we're just beginning to scratch the surface of. We talk about the soul and you know, it's not something that a lot of uh, doctors or healthcare practitioners are comfortable uh, talking about. But as an oncologist, I'll see people and I'll work with them on all different levels. So I'll work with them with chemotherapy, with radiation, with bone marrow transplantation, with targeted therapies, immune therapies. So the mind uh, is good uh, for all of that. The mind is good for helping you decide where you want to get an education, how you pay your bills, okay? All those things, that's why the mind was given to us. But when you develop an illness suddenly, like cancer or somebody in your family does, that mind that's helping you pay your bills and get an education and do your job, and you ask, why is this happening? Just going to be like torture. And so uh, that creates a lot of suffering for people when that's all that they know. And so one of the things I talk with people about, there's two ways of seeing and two ways of understanding. You can see and understand with your mind, and you can see and understand with your heart, your spiritual heart. You know, that's uh, the soul. And so it's sort of like uh, describing love. Ask somebody, well, prove love exists. Show me the formula. You know, show me what it looks like. Draw a picture of it. You know, you can, but you know it's there. And when you can quiet the mind through pranayama, 
through music, through sound, you can create that space. You can get an experience. And the electromagnetic field generated by the human heart is 5,000 times stronger than that generated by the brain. That's why you can put uh, electrodes on your ankles, your wrists, get a nice big EKG tracing for your heart. But you have to put electrodes right on the scalp and you can barely get a tracing for the brain. So it's the heart that's controlling the brain, not vice versa. So when we're doing meditations like this, we're moving into our heart. And then you can get the heart's wisdom. You can get the heart's perspective. You can get the heart's intuition. And then you can answer questions about why things like that are happening. It's a very different answer, though, than what the mind is going to give you. It doesn't create suffering. It creates more peace. So if you were to ask me, as a physician, what the most important factor was, what the foundation of regaining your health and keeping your health was, I tell you inner peace. That's like the foundation. So an architect will tell you the most important part of a building or a house is the foundation. It's not the curtains, it's not the carpet, it's not the shingles you have on your roof, it's the foundation. So if you pour a wet foundation that's cracked, you'll never have a good house. And by the same token, if you don't learn how to have inner peace in your life, you can't keep health. And as a doctor, we always hear a lot, doctors are saying, well, this is curable or this is incurable. Uh, so if you have strep throat, they'll give you some penicillin, they'll say, you'll be cured in 10 days, you don't need to come back. So patient feels good. If you have certain other illnesses, they'll say, oh, it's incurable. So automatically, the moment somebody hears that, all these epigenetic changes start to happen, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So healing is a much different concept. Healing is about wholeness. And so healing is about looking at everything as a process. And even with cancer, most adults are walking around with cancer by the time they're in their 20s. As I talk about in my book, when they've done autopsy studies of people who died in their 20s in car accidents or wars, when you do autopsy studies, you'll find dormant or precancerous lesion in the thyroid, the lung, the breast, pancreas, colon, often more than one. And so the goal really with cancer, if you haven't had it, you have about a 50-50 chance of getting it in your life. So you want to keep the dormant cancer cells dormant. If you have had active cancer, you want to get the cells back to dormancy and keep them dormant. But it's not about cure. You know, you're not going to get rid of every last cancer cell because you're not going to make one person different than the other seven billion on the planet. And, you know, there's an epidemic now of depression. Uh, there's so many people, you know, on medications for depression, for anxiety, for sleep for staying awake. You know, there's concentrating, doing better in school, medication for almost everything except one thing. They don't have a medication for inner peace. There's no such thing as a medication for that. So, you know, having a spiritual practice uh, has been found in numerous studies uh, to lower uh, levels of uh, depressive symptoms. I think it's important for all of you uh, just to get a sense that you can't get stuck in your life with, you know, a relationship, 
that's not working for you, that's constantly causing you stress, a job that you can't stand going to, or that's just filled with negative people, and think that it's not going to affect your health. You could see from what I've talked about today, they're one and the same. You know, there's not a mind-body connection. There's a mind-body unity. And so everything you're feeling, everything you're thinking, it's affecting your gene expression, the most fundamental part of what keeps you healthy, vibrant, alive. And so I'd encourage you uh, just to uh, not only get more in touch with the truth that's in your heart, uh, but have the courage to listen to it. Thank you. You have to look at yourself as a musical instrument. So you could have the best pianist in the world, but if he's playing a piano that's out of tune, it's not going to sound very good. Or if you have a guitar that's out of tune, doesn't matter how talented you are, doesn't, it's not going to sound good. So the human body, much more sensitive instrument than that. You have to retune yourself every day. So you have to do it through breathing practices, through exercise, through putting very high vibration foods in your body that affect your DNA in certain ways, by certain music, by chanting, all those things. Anything, you know, if you look at the word disease, dis-ease, it's a form of disharmony. So it's very important to recreate harmony in your life every day, not just two weeks a year if, when you happen to go on vacation. You know, if somebody has a cough one day, they wake up with a cough and it's not going away, and so a couple of days go by, they go see their doctor, and he does a chest x-ray and he says, you've got a big lung mass here, you need a biopsy, and they do the biopsy and he says, you've got lung cancer. That lung cancer didn't start two days ago when he started coughing. It started 20, 30 years ago when that first epigenetic change happened and then promoted progress. So when something takes that many decades to develop very often, you have to use something to shrink it down enough. But then you want to be able to use natural things along with it uh, to build up your immune system. Uh, there are a number of things that induce apoptosis. Apoptosis is normal cell death. So a normal cell, when it gets old, it'll die and make room for new cells. That's programmed. That's called apoptosis. So there are all these nutrients out there that induce apoptosis or can reintroduce it, like garlic like resveratrol found in the skin of red grapes, like turmeric, which is what gives curry its yellow color, all induce apoptosis or reinduce apoptosis. And then a lot of the newer drugs are based upon activating the part of the immune system that cancer inactivated. And there are a lot of mushrooms that will uh, do similar things, increase uh, those same lymphocytes, chaga, which grows on birch tree bark, reishi mushroom, coriolis, or turkey tail. Yeah, the question was uh, about the gut. And, you know, a lot of uh, what we call the gut microbiome, you know, and how that relates uh, to health and the brain and the genes in the gut. So 90% of the genes in your body come from your gut bacteria. They're not in your cells. 90% of the total genes in your body are in your gut bacteria. And there's a huge gut-brain connection. So if you have the wrong bacteria in your gut, a dysbiosis, 
from all the white sugar, the white flour, the heat damaged vegetable oils, the pesticides, the herbicides, the heavy metals, all that, they damage your gut bacteria profoundly. And that's why, uh, you know, babies that are born through vaginal birth, uh, they do have uh, a lot of right gut bacteria. They don't really so much have you know, the sex from the mother, because, you know, it's the same gut bacteria uh, in men and women. Uh, but it's very true uh, that babies that are born by C-section uh, have uh, more problems related uh, to the lack of gut bacteria. So it's very important to take care of your gut uh, for everything from cancer. You have a dysbiosis. Your gut's creating inflammatory chemicals 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They go throughout your body, promote diabetes, brain cell death, cancer, obesity, all those kinds of things. It's always helpful to find the blessing in everything. You know, so if you've gone through some adversity, no matter how bad, and you survived it, you got to look what it was in you that allowed you uh, to survive it. And, um, you know, that's part of what joy is, you know, sharing, you know, how you got through something, you know, with somebody who's going through some adversity. You know, all my patients, uh, even when they're first diagnosed with cancer, uh, a lot of them feel very powerless and, you know, just teaching them, you know, taking them through meditation, like that first meditation we listen to now. That's the meditation I let everybody listen to their first visit. So the first visit to an oncologist when you find out you have cancer, probably the most stressful day of a person's life. Got to find out about your prognosis, side effects of the chemotherapy. Who's going to take care of your kids if you have to go into the hospital? You know, real stressful things. And then I'll take people through some chanting and that meditation. And invariably, people look up and they'll say, that's the most relaxed and peaceful I've ever felt. So on the most stressful day of their life, they experience the most peace and relaxation they've ever felt. So that's very empowering, you know, to feel both at the same time. And just to know that that's possible. And so, you know, a lot of my patients who've beaten what they were told were terminal cancers go out and talk to thousands and thousands of people. You know? And one of the reasons that they do it is it changes consciousness. So when Roger Bannister he was the first man who broke the four minute mile. So in entire recorded human history, nobody had ever run a mile in under four minutes until he did it. So within three years after he'd done it, 12 people had done it. So what changed in entire recorded human history in those next three years? Consciousness, people knew it was possible. So, you know, the more, uh, people can share their experiences uh, of what they've been through. It changes consciousness for everybody. Thank you. Thank you.